Everybody. Good morning. It's always a wonderful time to be before you. Um, particularly in this time of the year, I feel um, that it's a, it's a special time. You know, it just, it kind of forces us to, you know, look back on the year and be thankful for, you know, what the Lord has done for us. Um, be thankful for what he's allowing us to go through. Um, we get you know, we get the time to spend with family. We get time to, you know, remember the family that's no longer with us. Um, and, you know, shortly after, we head to Christmas and we get to think about all the things um, that we receive in the life and death of Christ. Um, and so I think it's a time where we naturally just have our hearts are ripe for the word. Um, I think it's a great time to evangelize and um, just stand before the word. And so I pray that today um, that all of our hearts can be ripe, um, that we can be ready to be moved by the spirit. Um, I pray that the Lord uh, allows, allows that to happen. So if you don't mind, let's start in prayer. Lord, we thank you for um, this time that you've given us. Um, we thank you for your grace and mercy, Lord. We thank you for everything you've given us so freely that we don't deserve. Um, each and every one of us here today, um, we deserve death. We deserve um, to be in the darkness, but Lord, you've led us to the light by your grace. We pray, Lord, that you continue to work in our hearts you continue to move us. You continue to move us to a place that honors you more deeply. Uh, and I pray that each and every one of us, Lord, um, can be moved by your word today, that we may leave here today um, with a better appreciation for who you are um, and for who we are in you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I came to be thinking lately that you know, there's a certain pattern um, to this life that we all take on in some form or fashion. You know, there's different details to each one of our lives, but there's something that is very similar. And that pattern starts with this natural, um, this natural born insecurity that we all come into this world with. It's a insecurity that, you know, naturally makes us want to move um, to a place to protect ourselves, to cover ourselves up, um, almost a sort of vulnerability, a guilt. Um, and we know this is the cause of sin um, that we are all born in this world with. And we see it vividly with Adam and Eve. You know, the first, the first thing that takes place when Adam and Eve were in the garden and ate of the for forbidden fruit is that they lost their sense of security, they lost their sense of comfort, and the first thing that they desired to do was cover themselves up. The first thing that they wanted to do was to hide themselves from the presence of God. And it just shows that sense of insecurity that being in sin and being separated from the Lord brings us. And I think this pattern, how it plays out in our lives is interesting. You know, we, we feel, we come into this world with this sense of insecurity, and we don't necessarily know the details of why. Um, and so our natural inclination is to just assume that it's our environment, it's the things that have happened to us that make us feel the way that we feel. And so with that, it kind of looks like this. We have these insecurities, we have these vulnerabilities, and naturally when you're insecure, you want to defend yourself. And we create these self-defense mechanisms that kind of guard our lives. And with that, you know, it may be a situation where you were born into a poor family and your, go your life mission to secure yourself is to say that, you know, I'm gonna earn as much money as I can. I'm gonna create this generational wealth so that I don't have to be looked at as poor anymore. That's your idea of securing yourself. It may be a sense of 
just not getting enough attention. You may feel like you're undervalued. You may feel like you're overlooked. And your goal in life is to create the security by, you know, putting yourself out there, attaining a position that gives you the appreciation that you feel like you deserve. Um, it could be something, it could be the fact that you were mistreated or abused, you know, in your youth. And your idea of securing yourself is to, it may be expressing anger to anyone or anything that makes you feel the way that that person who mistreated you made you feel. Um, and I think the consistency in these is that although they may bring us um, temporary comfort or they may feel like we're actually attaining something, I think we all come to realize that these self-defense mechanisms don't work. And there's a next pattern that leads to this. So we realize, we try to secure ourselves, we realize that we're not capable of securing ourselves. And the next thing that it leads to is distraction. And the way that we deal with these vulnerabilities is to distract ourselves. And that could lead to addiction, that, that could be drugs, that could be just working a lot, becoming a workaholic, trying to drown out the noise that you feel. Um, it could be a multitude of things that we just use to engulf ourselves in so we don't have to think about this, in, this vulnerability, this insecurity that we don't want to um, embrace or touch. And after that, I think a lot of us, you know, we're here for a reason today, or we're listening um, in today for a reason. That's because one of two things, either we've come into a relationship with Christ or we desire to, um, and that's the next step in this journey. And we realize and we're confident in the things that Christ has done for us. We realize, for one, we're sinners, we realize that's a fact. We're all sinners, and we know that because we all experience death. You know, we, we realize that this, this sin, this death that we experience is very real. We're confident in that. And we're also confident in the fact that Christ um, has come upon this earth in humanly form, and he's lived and died for our sins. And... Um, you know, he, he bears the guilt of sin on the cross. He died and was risen for our sake. And so we know we're justified. And we all know when we first, for those of us, you know, who are saved and have experienced that initial emotion of first coming to the Christ, you're on fire. Your emotions are high. But it seems that we fall back into this place to where we start, our insecurities start to rise again, and we start to question, am I even saved? Um, how do I know that I'm saved? And these things of doubt, these thoughts of doubts arise, and you, you wonder why, um, but we have to wonder why this happens. You know, we've come to Christ, we've overcome all these natural things that we've come into, um, but yet we still feel this sense of insecurity. We know that Christ is who he says he's to be. We know that he can save sins, but yet I feel like I'm still insecure. I'm not solid in this. And there's a very valid reason for this. You know, there's multiple things that we come across that can, dr can drown our assurance. You know, it could be a lack of impact in the ministry could be you know you feel like you should have you should be able to evangelize to more people than you have maybe you should have be able to have an impact on those um, that are close to you that you just haven't seemed to be able to have it could be you start to realize that even though I've put my I believe in Christ I'm still dealing with certain sins or certain things that make me question am I saved am I supposed to be dealing with these things and there's a multitude of things that arise that make us question our assurance. And so that's kind of what I want to begin with today, is that we need to figure out where to go. After we realize 
that we're justified. We realize that Christ is able to save. How do we become confident that what he did was for me personally? That what he did on the cross is not just for all those people over there, or, but it's for me. And how do we attain that personal relationship? And one of my favorite verses um, that kind of touches on this is Jeremiah 9, 23, 24. Not directly, but indirectly. The verse reads, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord exercising love and kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. So what we see here is that the Lord is telling us that we clearly should stay away from becoming secure and boasting in the things that are natural to us, our wisdom, our strength, our riches. But he tells us that if you're to boast in anything, that you should boast in the knowledge of him. And so I think that's where this assurance starts. It starts with a deeper knowledge of what our inheritance truly entails. And the topic or the goal of today is I want to cover this doctrine, this sweet doctrine, that's called the doctrine of adoption. And I want to cover it in a way that we start off by getting an understanding of the, the super, superficial view of what this doctrine is. And then I want to dive deep into the Gospel of John to see what the Apostle John, how he lay, lays this out that we can understand the depth of it. And I think it's very vital that we get past justification and we really learn what it means to be a child of God. And so let's start with an overview of what adoption is. The question is, what is adoption? It's the gracious act of God wherein he makes justified sinners his beloved children. The Westminster Confession says to be adopted is to receive God's name and to have access to God's throne, his pity, his protection, his provision, his discipline, and his promise to never abandon us. Adoption is rooted in God's eternal plan and exhaustible love. We heard Rico read in Ephesians today that God predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. His desire to place sinners in his family through the work of his son proceeds even the work of creation. We can only marvel at the kindness of God, who would not call us merely his friends, but also his sons and daughters. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The theologian, Robert Webb, I think, explains it in a great way. He says, when we approach him in the intensity of worship, we gather up all the sweetness involved in fatherhood and all the tenderness wrapped up in sonship. When calamities overcome us and troubles come in like a flood, we lift up our cry and stretch out our arms to God as a compassionate father. When the angel of death climbs in at the window of our homes and bears away the objects of our love, we find our deepest we find our, our dearest solace in reflecting upon the fatherly heart of God. When we look across the swelling flood, it is our Father's house on the light-covered hills beyond the stars, which, we cheer, which cheers us amid the crumbling of the earthly tabernacle. We also see that adoption is the heart of the storyline in the Bible. When Adam's descendants through Abraham wound up as slaves in Egypt, something tremendous happened. God didn't just save them from Pharaoh, he called Israel his own son. God was at work bringing a fallen people near him. He brought them into the land he had promised to Abraham and pledged if they would serve him, that he would once again walk among them, just as he did in Eden. Sadly, Israel failed. They repeatedly rejected God's law and his love, David knew 
God was a compassionate father to those who feared him, but no one feared him as they should. What God did next still sends thrills up a Christian spine. The perfect sovereign, the creator, the eternal father sent his only begotten son, Christ Jesus, into the world. Jesus gave up his life, bearing his father's wrath as he suffered and died on the cross. Yet by this tragedy, God accomplished the unthinkable. He accomplished atonement for his people. And the application of the atonement, he justified sinners and gives them new birth. Not only that, but the father welcomes them into his family. Is there better news? Is there better news? We live in a world full of people longing for a home, a place to belong and a seat at the table. God the Father through the Son, through God the Son and by the power of God the Spirit does so much more. He gives repentant sinners his very name and makes them his heirs. And so with that overview, I want to take a deep dive into the Gospel of John. And today we're going to be focusing on John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Now, the purpose of John's writings is essentially to give us assurance. He wrote his gospel so that we may believe. And there's a reason behind that. Assurance is the key to everything. Without assurance, we will not be able to have an impact as we ought to have in this life. We won't be able to move and do things because we'll still be suffering from this insecurities and we'll be drowned out by doubt. The apostles, when they made their major moves, it was through the assurance of the Holy Spirit. Um, and again, this, is, this assurance is taking place after we placed our faith in Christ. And so there is the initial sense of this faith that isn't just a faith that's on you know, propositions, but it's a faith of reliance. It's a very personal faith that we must have. And we see here, if we truly believe in him, John tells us that we become children of God. So here, salvation does not merely mean that our sins are forgiven and that we are justified, justified before God. It does certainly include those things, but that's not all. Our first need, as we said, is the need of, um, the need of a guilty man is to be set free. We are not sick, we are guilty, and we need forgiveness, and that's justification. But it doesn't stop at that, and the tragedy today is that a lot of times we do stop at that. The most wonderful thing that, is that our whole status and relationship before God becomes new. You know, we not, we're not forgiven and we're just remaining the same person. Um, it was said that, you know, a judge can acquit somebody, but it takes a father to adopt. And so here we are. Um, we become, we can become the children of God. And what does this mean? So as we take a look at John here, we have to pay uh, special attention to detail, and there's a couple things I want to touch on before we actually get into the verses. The first thing that we have to realize is that John never uses the word sons in his gospel. He uses the word children. Um, other people, other the apostle Paul, he tends to favor sons. And you may ask me asking why are we making this distinction? Well, there's a slight difference that's important. Sons is more objective. It's more it references more to our external position. Uh, it's an external detail of our relationship. The word children refers more to the nature and not just position. The children emphasizes direct and immediate relationship to God. The second thing that I want to touch on before we get in is the Bible always presents our relationship as children of God in terms of our Lord and Jesus Christ. It's always in association with Christ, and I make this point because there's a teaching of this universal fatherhood. 
the idea that everybody is a child of God. And the tragedy of the world is that people don't know that, and the real business of teaching and evangelizing is to let people know that they are the children of God, whether they know it or not. Now, it's clearly stated here in John, in verse 12, where he says, to as many as received him, to as many as received him. For one, we have to notice if, if we were all sons of God, children of God, all of us, everyone in this earth, there would be no need for Christ to have come to this earth. And so it's only through the Son that we attain this title of children or this position of children of God. And if we look at the context of this direct context of this verse in John 11, we can see exactly what um, we're referring to here. In John 1.11, it says, he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. So right now, we clearly see that this is making a clear distinction between those who have received him and those who have not. Have, have not. And in verse 12, he says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So there's a clear there's a clear distinction between those who are children of God and those who are not. And that is very important when it comes to evangelizing. It becomes very important when uh, we, see, we see all these things on TV where it, it focuses on God loves all, even though we clearly see that they're blaspheming everything that the Lord stands for. Um, but they have this notion that God just loves all and there's not a distinction between his true children and everyone else. Um, and so it's important to note that as we talk about becoming the children of God, that there is a distinction between those who are and those who aren't. And um, running through the Bible, there is a clear division as well of those who are, the, those who are and those who aren't. All the benefits come to us through him. No man comes to the Father except through me. Justification, sanctification, glorification, and becoming the children of God are all benefits that only come directly through Christ. All people are not children of God. Something has to happen to us before we become the children of God. The good news of salvation is not that we already are the children of God, but we can become the children of God. And so that brings us to our next point as we're looking in John 1, verse 12. And we're really going to take as much time as we can to slow walk through what each word or each phrase here is being said because a lot of these things we can read over and miss the true significance of. And so in verse 12, um, it says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. In some of your translations, it may say power. And there's also a false teaching of, of this, where um, some people say, well, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, well, you have the power to become like, you have, to be coward, you have the power to become the children of God, which essentially gives you the possibility. You know, some people, if they hold on to this power, can do it. Some people can't. And that's what the Roman Catholic teaches, Roman Catholic teachings uh, say, and it's erroneous. The actual word is used 102 times in the New Testament, and its meaning is authority, its meaning is right, privilege. John Calvin says its meaning, it means to be reckoned worthy of. It means to those who believe on him, he makes them worthy to become children of God. This is something that happens to people who believe on him. It's not a possibility which they can exercise. It is something that happens to all of those who believe in him. And the important thing of all this is realizing that in all of, the, all of this action that is taking place, it's all of God. It's through Christ, and it's him who puts us in, this, in these positions. It's not by our own doing. And so that brings us to our next point, where we're still in verse 12. 
And it says, to them he gave the right to become. I want to touch on this word become, where it says about Christ. We're never told that Jesus Christ became the Son of God. That's because he always was. Again, there's people who believe that Jesus Christ did indeed become the Son of God, which is erroneous. The only thing that Jesus Christ became was flesh. He was eternally he was the eternal son. And now us, on the other hand, we have to become the children of God because we're not. We are by nature children of wrath. Our father, as we come into this world, is Satan. Become is used pur- purposefully because there is a change in us, a real change. He doesn't, stay, he doesn't say that we have the honor to be called the children of God which wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing, but it goes beyond that. He says, we have become. And it states that there's a change in a real sense, like the word became flesh, was real. Jesus indeed became flesh. We also become the children of God in a sense. And there's a real change in that. And so that brings us to our next phrase, which is become children of God. Children of God, what does this mean? Children of God is not just a name, but it refers to nature, as we talked about. It's not an honorary title that leaves the man or woman unchanged, but there is a real transformation. In a sense, like a child is like his parents. A child bears something in him like his parents, and it means we have been transformed in the likeness of God change in our vital capacity, change in our perceptions, change in our emotions. And there's many scriptures um, that we can go to to point this out. And we'll start with Galatians 3.26 that states, for all of you, for all our son, for you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And there's also a great explanation of this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. I really like this breakdown where Peter says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through us, through lust. And so we see there, there's a very clear change that occurs in us that's important to realize. The the children of God, um, it carries that meaning where we become more and more like God. And there's also a great explanation in the in first John where he discusses it in terms of love you can't say where John says you can't say that you're a child of God if you don't love your brother he also says we know we have passed from death to life in other words we know we have become children of God because we love the brethren in other words we are like our father what this says what this says is that it's saying is that we become like God, and we can't say, we can't be, um, you know, in this sense, hating our brother. We can't be reflecting the world and reflecting everything opposing of God and saying that we're children of God. As we're learning here, when we become children of God, our nature changes. We become more bent like him, and we continue to become more like him. And that's why you see these verses where it says, You know, if you don't love your brother, how can you say that you love God? And there's there's similar things, such of the commandments. The commandments are God's commandments. They are expression of his character, what he likes. If you say you're a child of God and don't keep the commandments, you're a liar. The child loves, the child of God loves his commandments. To be a child of God means you partake in something of the divine nature and you manifest this in your life. 
Love your, love your enemies. Pray for those who hate you. Do good for those that malign you. Well, why? Why do we do these things? Because our Father does these things. Another thing here is we see that John was focusing particularly on the Jews when he was writing this because they felt that they were the only ones with the right to become children of God and not the Gentiles. But we see here, John says, but as many as received him, Gentiles along with Jews. Another thing we see is that Jews liked to glory on the fact that they were children of Abraham. And we read in John 8, 31, where Jesus is talking to the Jews, where he says, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answer to him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say, you will, how can you say we will be made free? And so you, you see this clear distinction of they gloried in their relationship of being descendants to Abraham. And John says, the glory of this gospel is that through Christ, you don't become children of Abraham, even though that was, you know, it wasn't something to be taken lightly, but you become the children of God himself. It doesn't stop at Abraham. It lifts you to the family of God. And here is the gospel. Here is the gospel that the Gentiles that are those on the outside, the dogs, the lost, anybody can become a child of God. If he knows and receives and believes the only begotten son of God. The word that became flesh and dwelt among us is a direct relationship or a direct reflection of how we receive this sonship. And this is the important thing that we need to realize about ourselves. This is, it changes the way that you think when you understand the true inheritance that you receive in Christ. It's more than just being justified. It's more, there's more to this story. We have received a new nature. And if we don't realize that, it brings in room for insecurities. It brings in room for us to question, are we saved? Because we don't understand the fullness that was given, the fullness of, of that which was given to us. And so the last part I want to touch on this is how do we become the children of God? How do we become the children of God? We talked about that we have to become it because we are not it by nature. And that brings us to verse 13 where it says um, those who were born, those who were born, so we see here, this is where we get into the doctrine of regeneration. And all that is, is just the fact that the understanding that we have to be changed, we have to be born again. This is, we don't remain the same. There has to be a newness in us for us to be children of God. And we see this. We see this in the conversation with Nicodemus and Jesus when Jesus responded to Nicodemus saying, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We know that Paul says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. In James 1.18, which I find interesting, is James says, of his own will, speaking of the Lord, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And another one, 1 Peter 1 23 states, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So we see that all these, all these verses are saying the same thing. We have to be changed. We have to be born again and we become new creatures as we come to the Lord. And if we look in, um, if we want to look further on how does this birth actually take place, we know that Nicodemus was kind of dumbfounded by this. You know, he, 
said, well, how am I born again? Do I have to climb back and, you know, to my mother's womb? Like, how, what is this, what do I have to do to be born again? What can I do to be born again? Um, and, of course, that's a valid question because we all want to be children of God. We want to know how to do this. And our natural instinct is, what can I do? What can I do in my flesh to become a child of God? And so we see that John touches this in verse 13. Again, we're in John chapter 1, verses uh, 12 and 13. In verse 13, he touches this in a few negative ways. Um, He says, Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So those first three are negatives, not of blood. What does this mean? What does this mean? So this was a direct shot at Jews, as we talked about, who believed everything came from natural descent. Blood came down through Abraham. John says it's not of the blood. It's not of blood. He also says it's nor of the will of the flesh. Well, what is this will of the flesh? This refers to natural procreation. We are all naturally born by the will of the flesh. And what this means essentially is that you can have a mother and father that are Christians. It doesn't mean that the child's going to be a Christian. There's also a third negative. You have not of the blood, not of, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of the man. So where does will of the man and will of the flesh differ? Well, will of the man is not touching on procreation, It's touching on man's willpower. We can't be, we can't train our kids, you know, we can't do certain things that will just make our kids a Christian. We can't train them, we can do all, we can try all that we can, but it's not a matter of human endeavor. It's not a matter of our willpower of becoming the children of God. So we see here, this has nothing to do with man at all. We see we have to be born again. We have to be born again, but it's not having to do with man. He puts, so after we read the first three negatives, there's a positive. He says, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but the positive here is but of God. And the Lord makes it clear that we cannot do anything in our flesh. We are a slave of sin, and our natural mind, our natural inclination is to be at enmity with God. But we see here, we see here how we become the children of God, and I think Ephesians 2.10 touches on this a little bit where it says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we see that we're the workmanship of God before we even came to pass. This has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with him and his will. It's all God. Now we have to work it out, of course, but man and his activity is entirely excluded. You don't become Christian because you're a part of a certain nation or because of your parents or because of any human efforts. It is all of God. And if we go back, there's something interesting that takes place about this birth as well. And you may have noticed it as we went through James 1.18 and 1 Peter 1.23. I'll go back through those to see what the common theme is here. James 1.18 says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. By the word of truth. 1 Peter 1.23 having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever, through the word of God. So we, hear, we see here there's this tandem between the word of God and the spirit that works in us. We are begotten by the spirit and the word. The word is like a seed. We are in a sense, impregnated by the Spirit through the Word. 
and new life comes into being, and a new nature comes into being, and a new man comes into being, and he hasn't been born of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of the man, but of God. It's only the Father who can beget, and as God is our Father, God is our begetter. Now, what does this mean? This is what it means to be a Christian. If we are not the proudest people in a spiritual sense, it means we don't understand this doctrine. The question is, do you think of yourself like that? Do you behave like that? Do you glory in the fact that you are children of God? Calvin puts it in a great way where he says, the Son of God became the Son of Man, that we, the sinful sons of men, can become sons of God. And I'll read that one more time. The Son of God became the Son of Man, that we, the sinful sons of men, can become sons of God. So what you see here is that we're so much more than justified. It's so much more than just understanding that Christ has died for sin. We realize that, and we realize that he died for our sin, and we must know that. We must believe in that wholeheartedly, but that's not where we stop. If we stop there, we're still going to be lacking in this uh, security. We're going to be lacking assurance. We're not going to be firm in what we do, and you'll realize that your life is not necessarily changed the way that you think it should be changed. As we start to learn more, as we start to dive deeper and we realize that we're not just justified, but we have a father who chose us to become part of his family before the foundations of the earth. And not only do we become children of God, but we receive all these benefits in Christ. We have a new nature. We have a new ability to look at things. We don't have to keep falling victim to these self-defense mechanisms that we build. We don't have to continue to rely on the flesh to respond. You know, we have a lot of, you know, there's people out there that say, you know, I'm saved but not sanctified. And they, that's saying, that's, that's wanting to be justified, but you don't want to take the, you don't want to take the next step. You want to still live in the way that you want to live. And you want to still keep these self-defense mechanisms. You want to still be respond in anger when this when you feel like um, someone offends you. You still want to you still want to hold on to these things that have brought you security in the past. Um, but what we see here is that we can release these self-defense mechanisms that we've built up over time. We can release these insecurities that are within us that drive us to do things that um, hinder us, distract us. Um, But we can launch ourselves fully on the Lord, knowing that we're sealed in his family. We've been made new, um, and there's nothing that anyone can do that can take that from us. Um, Now, I understand that it's not always true that everyone has believed. But this is also important if you haven't put your life in Christ to understand what the fullness of you doing this means. It's not just, you don't just stand before this judge who doesn't care about you, but you stand before a God who wants to be your father, who wants to bring you in his family, and wants to give you the inheritance um, that is above all things. And so if that is you, I pray that you take heed um, to this doctrine, you know, dearly, that you look into it, that you understand that there's more than being justified, but he renews us, we're born again, we can release all those things that we've had to guard ourselves against, we can become vulnerable, we can be naked again as they were in the garden, we don't have to cover ourselves up, we don't have to hide ourselves from this guilt that we feel um, because we understand the fullness of this adoption that we have in Christ. And 
it's a beautiful thing, and I, again, I just pray um, that we can all understand the fullness of this, and I pray that the Spirit gives us a living awareness of this, um, that it can become personal to us, um, that we don't have to keep struggling um, in this darkness, that we don't have to continue to hide things from the Lord, um, but that he's, we're in his family. We can openly give him all things, and he'll gladly pour out his love upon us. And again, it's a beautiful doctrine. Um, and let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your grace and mercy. We thank you so much for being more than a judge to us, Lord. You're our Father. Um, some of us um, don't have fathers in our lives. Some of us don't have, haven't been raised in a perfect environment. Some of us have experienced traumatic things um, that we've had to build up self-defense mechanisms to guard us against, Lord. But we're thankful that by your grace, Lord, you've, you've allowed us to be renewed in you, to be reborn in you, Lord, that we can live a new life that is free from all those things that keep us guarded, from all those things from, that prevent us from loving like we should, um, from living like we should, from experiencing the peace and joy that we should experience in you, Lord. We thank you for Christ. We thank you for putting all of our sins, Lord, undeservingly on the hem. All our past, future, and present sins, Lord, you've covered. We don't have to cover ourselves, Lord. You've covered us. You've given us everything we need to honor you, Lord, and I pray that every single one of us in this building today, everyone watching, um, that we may, again, we may rejoice in our new family. We may rejoice in our new nature. Um, and that we can just appreciate the fullness of what Christ coming into this earth really means. There's so much to it, Lord. And we, I pray you continue to open our hearts and minds to continue to receive more and more um, of your word and truth. And we love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.